Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate those kind words. And uh, just a little bit of housekeeping on my part. I put that picture up there because over the years, I've come to understand that it's all about attitude in anything that you do. It's all about attitude. And I've used this picture quite often, and I've referred to it for myself quite often. So uh, I just let, wanted to say that. The other thing is, put away all of your agronomic questions, all the agronomic things that you've been hearing over the last two days, which have been tremendous. The information being shared here is beyond, beyond. But I'm going to take a little different approach today, and I'm going to, I'm going to follow a tight script because what I want to say is my interpretation, and I want to make sure that I get it right from my perspective. So I'm going to see if I can make this work, and we will uh, move forward. So it's all about roles. So I speak to you today as a farmer and from a farmer's perspective. But know that I'm speaking with the understanding that all of us, farmers, merchants, teachers, politicians, students, have roles of critical importance in our organic food system. Holding true to what I have experienced over the years, organic farmers have always been unique in their willingness to share their knowledge and experience without asking for anything in return. O-grain is probably one of the best examples of this sharing mindset. This willingness to share is what has made organic farming what it is today, a unique food production system if we strive to keep it that way. The challenges are out there and they are looming larger and larger, even as the consumer interest in our environment, our climate, and our food continues to grow. So, let me set the stage for what I choose to call the promise of organic farming, which as J.I. Rodale began to define early on the promise for the land, the economy, and the people. The promise that is in the integrity of our organic food system. I got my college education at St. John's University in Minnesota, where over time they have established one of the most beautiful arboretums in central Minnesota. It is worth a trip to the campus to see it and to walk its many trails. There is a monk there who was responsible for the establishment of this site, Father Paul Schweitz. He died way too young to see his promise. However, he had a vision and an understanding well ahead of his time. And there is a plaque dedicated to one of the many trails through the Arboretum, which really reflects the vision and the understanding of the promise and our needed actions if we are to be beneficiaries of the promise and what roles we need to play in that ecosystem. Understanding this intimacy of the system is what successfully fulfilling organic farming is all about. But of equal importance, as every organic farmer is well aware of, is the patience necessary to let nature reveal the intimacy Every season, this intimacy is experienced in new and profound ways. Early springs, late springs, wet summers, dry summers, colorful and bounteous harvest seasons, even as we are perplexed by this abundance in spite of another challenging season. This is the ecology, the nature quantity of organic farming. There's also a human element, human quantity, the people, the social web, and Duncan Hilchie says it best, 
If a place or a region is defined by what most scholars of reg regionalism argue is the intersection of land and people, or culture and environment, then local food and agriculture together constitute a profound expression of place. For it is in the toil of human activity on the lo local landscape that food and other tangible products are created that reflect the cultural uniqueness of a place. Wes Jackson, Wendell Berry, Cesar Chavez, Chief Seattle, and countless others have all written or shown us the critical importance of people and land as integral pieces of the promise. As you can see, Chief Se Seattle says, all things share the same breath, the beast, the tree, the man. The air shares its spirit with all the life it supports. Organic farmers from the very beginning came together and continue to gather as evidenced again here today because of the social need to share and to learn. And there is a third component to the organic uh, agriculture promise, namely the economics. George Wilkes, from his Angry Trout Cafe notebook, summarizes it quite well. Our economy is what we do and how we live. It is here to work that wor the work of sustainability takes place. Nature is sustainable. The human spirit is sustainable. In the economy, well, that needs a little help. I set this stage because we all need to be reminded every now and then about the organic farming promise. And it must continue. So what do we do or need to be doing today as we look to the future of the organic food system? and become the beneficiaries of the organic farming promise. We know we cannot live in the past, just as those who came before us in the, in the organic world did not live in the past when they began defining organic farming. The bigger question might be, how does the organic food production system we have been developing avoid losing sight of that promise and fall into the same quagmire as non-organic agriculture. Agriculture is distinguished from other industries by the fact that it has the potential to be self-sustaining. Managed carefully, it can be renewable and continuing. Yet, this may not be the way we are managing our farms today, including some organic farms. One dominant paradigm of agriculture today is the economic philosophy that every farm ought to be bigger than it is, no matter how big it is. It has become a kind of unquestioned bedrock idea that every farm is expected to grow. Every farm is expected to expand. Every farm is expected to be just a little bit bigger than it is now. This is the basis that many farmers, this is the bias, excuse me, that many farmers hold, that many of the public also holds. And it is reflected in public policy. And it is not unique to non-organic farmers. The self-sufficient, diversified farm that once dominated the landscape continues to give way to specialized, industrialized agriculture. As farming becomes more and more dependent on the international marketplace, the pressure to increase production grows. Farmers pursue big crops in good years and bad. The ultimate transformation is now a system totally capital intensified. Producing more and producing efficiently have become the mantras of 21st century farming. A deeper analysis, however, reveals that it isn't a question of big pig or little pig, corporate farming or family farming. These are only indicators of the fact that we are losing sight of the promise. 
a driving force that continues to dominate our 21st century agriculture and non-organic alike is the historically based human desire to dominate and conquer nature. Technology will be there, but it is not and cannot be the salvation for the viability of organic farming into the future. As Joseph Campbell reiterates, our con computers, our tools, our machines are not enough. We have to rely on our intuition, our true being. Rejecting these structures was and must continue to be a primary purpose for evolving the organic food and marketing system. Losing sight of the promise will leave us helpless and consequently frustrated. And what will follow will be the blame game and the co copping out of looking at ourselves as the victims because we take no responsibility for our inaction. So if we let someone else in charge and we determine the value of our labor and the fruits of our work based on what someone else has decided, we set ourselves up for frustration and failure. After that, the only question remaining will become whether the economic rights of agribusiness corporations are more important and will take priority over the basic human rights of people. An organic food and marketing system cannot be a non-organic food production and marketing system. The difference is the promise. And this promise must be constantly and continually defined and maintained. It is a gift not given but earned. In the end, the promise is defined in terms of value systems. Organic agriculture's promise is fulfilled when an approach to farming is based first and foremost on environmental stewardship, social responsibilities, and economic equality. And a level, and a level playing field in the market is the best guarantee that this promise will be earned. I include market here for a critical reason. Farmer attitude in, of individualism is self-destructive when it comes to protecting our livelihoods in the marketplace. Our ability to produce only in relation to market needs and not in relation to our fellow farmers is not one of our strongest management skills. We appear quite incapable of disciplining our productive capacities, a modern day agriculture phenomenon that invariably causes boom and bust cycles in market supply and demand. We experience this over and over, year after year, crop after crop. This understanding of farmers' tragic flaw is the substance of the preamble to the bylaws of a major organic farming marketing co-op. In part, it says, marketing market price levels must include a reasonable return for labor management and financial investment. However, this same preamble goes on to state that market value must reflect the costs inherent in maintaining the social and environmental infrastructures of our total food production system for succeeding generations. Said in a different way, it simply means monetizing the ecosystem services that we as an organic farm as as organic farmers have the responsibility to carry out and maintain 
monetizing ecosystem services the, is the often overlooked rationale that justifies higher organic farm gate prices. Monetizing ecosystem services is the only means by which society will continue to be the beneficiary of the economic, the social, and the environmental gifts of a sustainable, organic, and regenerative food production system, the promise. In other words, as a quote I found in a major corporate publication lately stated, no margin, no mission. However, as Aldo Leopold has so clearly stated, obligations have no meaning without conscience. And the problem we face is the extension of the social conscience from people to the land. It's called a land ethic. For the first time in 7,000 years, humanity is beginning to recognize that as yet it has not invented a global agriculture that preserves its essential resource base. Dan Barber, in his book, The uh, Third Plate, says it beautifully in another way. Our job isn't just to support the farmer. It is really to support the land that supports the farmer. That is a larger distinction than it sounds. Even the most sustainably minded farmers grow crops and raise meats in proportion to what we demand. And what we demand generally throws off the balance of what the land, and I might add the waters, can reasonably provide. And so we go back to that original slide. The challenge to fulfilling the responsibility of protecting and enhancing the ecosystem services embedded in the principles of organic farming will always be attitude. And it's attitude towards profit, the economic piece. It's attitude towards responsibility, the environmental piece. And it's attitude towards people, the social, the social piece. Which brings us face to face then with the challenges. What are the challenges? What are the roadblocks to growing and protecting the promise inherent in organic agriculture? Deprivation of direct stakeholders. How do we get new and beginning farmers back on the land? That's the social piece. The loss of land fertility resources. How do we get livestock out of the buildings and back on the land? The environmental. And finally, the loss of the entrepreneurship. How do we create a level playing field with the industrialization that is taking place? The economic piece. So if these are the challenges, what are the solutions? What did I do here? Okay, there we go. A call for people to return to the countryside to farm is not mere nostalgia, but a practical necessity. As the true costs of industrial agriculture become harder to ignore, society will have to find sustainable ways to farm, and those ways will require more people on the land. Words from Wes Jackson. He defines the mission quite well here, and he also adds sort of the promise. But what I'm not reading is the margin. What will be the means to walk our talk? The means to start new and beginning farmers. The means to get livestock back on the land. 
or the means to level the playing field with industrial agriculture. How do we, def how do we finance this paradigm shift? And how do we provide the continuity of this paradigm shift? There will be a cost. Most of us in this room truly believe in the mission of a more sustainable organic agriculture and food system because we understand the promise, or I have to assume you wouldn't be here today. Joe, John Meacham, however, defines it this way. We have to have some kind of moral commitment to something larger than ourselves. We cannot do it alone, nor should we even try. The moral commitment is the realization and understanding that we as farmers and non-farmers must decide and clarify what it is we need and not what we want. My dad told me long ago when I started farming, he said, Carmen, if you don't know how big you want to be, you will never be big enough. And these needs must be defined in the realm of the common good. With the common good as the guide on, each of us has to decide for ourselves just what organic agriculture truly is and how we can be the beneficiaries of the promise. So it all comes down to a freedom of choice. The freedom to choose is the action of us defining the path to this promise. So moving this mission forward to achieve and participate in the promise becomes a process. Making things happen both as individuals and collectively begins with accepting the simple fact that all of us especially we farmers, have an impact on our food production and marketing system. We do this through self-awareness. That is our sense of place, our roles in the system. We do it through our gifts of creativity and innovation, our imagination. We do it through our conscience, our moral compass our uniqueness, our humanness, we and the common good. And finally, we do it as our determination to make it happen. And the end result is the margin that we create that goes back to completing the mission. But these decisions do have consequences. And through all of this, we must not allow ourselves to become victims of our decisions and our choices, but instead we must become the beneficiaries. These need to be conscious decisions. The decision to pursue the promise is an individual decision, but creating the means must be become a collective decision to generate collective action that will secure the promise. The history of any civilization is the history of its agriculture. The story of a civilization feeding itself, caring for its young, and learning from its elders. How we respect and take care of our soil and follow our humans is a ref and, and fellow humans is a reflection of how well we have done in all of these areas. A reflection of how well we write our part of the story. We must come together as a single voice. And this single voice must be strong and enduring. Sir Albert Howard pointed out 
that nature works on a very small margins. The amount contributed by each plant or animal, and I might add human, is quite tiny. It is the additive total, however, which impresses us. Each of us must, must strive to do our part. How each of us in this room planning to secure our mission of protecting and growing the promise of an ecologically, socially, and economically sound and equitable system, what is it? First of all, I think let's, let's continue to learn to appreciate more fully and understand the friendliness of nature. Sharpen the awareness of our individual responsibilities. Joseph Campbell, as I alluded to earlier, said technology is not going to save us. Our computers, our tools, our machines are not enough. We have to truly rely on intuition and our true being. The human element must prevail. So I can't read from a crystal ball and tell you what organic agriculture will look like in 100 years, or 50 years, or even 25 years. However, what I can tell you is that it will be different, that it will change, and that this difference and this change will happen. How it happens and changes will be agricultural history's breach or promise our grandchildren will be talking about. One thing is certain. The history of organic agriculture is no longer just about a food system. It is about global, because cultures are now global, societies are now global. Impacts of decisions I make in my home county of Lac Parle in western Minnesota, where I grew up, no longer stop at the county line. Our actions move around the world at the speed of texts or tweets. Markets and trade go on 24-7. It is now possible to see firsthand and measure within years rather than decades our impacts on the environment and society. Wendell Berry's words begin to ring true with each and every passing season. Think globally, but act locally. The actions we take here in our own back 40s will in today's global economy very quickly impact what takes place across the planet, socially, economically, and environmentally. So let me conclude with a couple of thoughts that point us in the direction that I think we need to be looking as we write the history of organic agriculture destined to fill our promise. Michael Pollan has written, we are what we eat, eats. In the end, each of us is involved in the history of agriculture because each of us is an eater and each of us is an organism of this earth. As eaters, we will define the history of organic agriculture as we cultivate our soils, as we drive our cars, as we buy our clothes, as we shop the grocery aisles, and as we sit and eat, eat with our friends and family. And as long as we are eating, we are creating the promise that is organic agriculture. Thank you. <laughs>